One of my favorite things to discuss with people over the years is I get this question a lot. Why is spirituality so difficult? You know, why do the prophets make things so complicated? Why is it parables and mysteries? And, you know, why can't they speak to us directly? And one of my simplest answers is they do. They do tell us directly stuff like um, there's no such thing as death and you're the light and, you know, you're a piece of God and that kind of stuff. Buddha said you're Buddha. But you tell someone, guess what? You're Buddha. That doesn't answer it for them, okay? The fact is they can be very, very simple and clear and it doesn't really help that much. Because why? The difficult thing is the ego. That's the thing that's complex. That's the thing that twists and turns everything, okay? And all of us are afflicted with that disease, if you will, the disease of ego. But if we shush that thing, it actually becomes very clear. And it's the simplest of all things to understand spirituality. So to take complex spiritual themes and make them simple is one of my goals for people who are interested in that. And so today what we're going to talk about is a couple different concepts that I like to mash together. One of them is the six degrees of separation idea. Have you heard of that before? The six degrees of separation? That's usually associated with Kevin Bacon. Am I right? That's what it is? The, you know, how many steps it takes to get from Kevin Bacon to another actor. I don't know if that's the original six degrees thing, but it's certainly one where most of us are familiar with, okay? But as I understand that concept, all of us are connected to everyone else in the world by just six steps. You know someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows the president. I mean, it's just, that's how it is. And it only takes six steps to do that. And so there's the concept, six degrees of separation. Well, I'm going to flip that into spirituality and six steps towards enlightenment, right? Six degrees away from our awakening. And we're actually going to make it even more simple by chopping it into in half into just three concepts that we're going to talk about today. Three simple concepts to make spirituality simple. So you not just six degrees of separation, although we're going to include six, we're going to really shave it down into just three degrees of separation. Recognizing this basic fact, the truth is we're not separate at all. The fact is, is you can't be separate from your true self. Awakening is already coded within all of us already. We can't go anywhere without it. So we're not separate at all, nor could we be separate, but the nasty thing called the ego makes us feel like we're separate. And in order to bridge that gap, it requires some concepts. So again, we can learn how to tame the ego. So we'll go through those concepts, but the motivation for this, the idea uh, was something I was, I was reading a, um, it's another thing I hear all the time, like how long is it gonna take? You know, to awaken, you know, the, the enlightenment process, boy, it's been seven years or 17 years or seven weeks. You know, most everybody complains at some point about how it's taking so long. OK, well, Sadhguru, one of my favorite teachers of this, uh, was asked that question. How long is it going to take? And he gave, again, a sublime answer, very resonant with me, too. Is he said it's not a matter of time. First of all, time is an illusion, and so that's, we could throw that out the window, okay? He said it's not a matter, matter, a matter of time. It's more a matter of intensity as it relates to your desire, okay? And so that's going to be the first concept uh, in, this, in the six degrees of separation from our true self. The first concept that I want to focus on is your desire. Well, what does that mean, and what was Sadhguru talking about? Well, the length of time it takes to do anything is ultimately determined by how interested you are in on the topic, okay? You know, if it's about like mowing my lawn or baking a cake or whatever, if I'm not really interested in mowing my lawn, lawn it's not going to mow itself. And so it'll just keep growing until I'm like, oh, I guess it's time to mow the lawn. And that could take weeks. It could take years. It just depends, right? So when, when we're talking about awakening and enlightenment and the desire to find the true self and to really get spirituality, the way Sadhguru was talking about it and the way I want to emphasize is it's dependent on this one concept and it's step number one in our degrees of separation. What do you desire? Now, secondary, these are the top three I want to emphasize that I want us to all remember, but on the, on the level of other concepts to sort of weave in, it's the concept of duality. Okay? We're living in a world that's dualistic. There's a physical world and a spiritual world, or a physical world and a non-physical world. The definition of spirituality being non-physical. Okay? And most of us can grasp it like that. And so the question of desire is, what is it that you're desiring? To know your physical self or to, or to know your non-physical self? And there's the key right there. Most of us are trying to use spirituality to work on our physicality. And we're using our physicality to access spirituality. And that can be done, but it really confuses us. 
Because then we, we fall into traps all the time, mostly of judging other people for their issues and their stuff. And we're not applying a lot of the very important spiritual rules, okay? And so question number one is, what is it you're desiring? And it's what we talk about in New Eyes, chapter 17, called duality. That's the chapter uh, in which Jesus teaches you are too. It's a very great, it's a great Gnostic um, idea from the Gospel of Thomas. He asks the question, when you are two, what will you do? And so we're spiritual beings having a physical experience. We take on a body. And now we have this false self idea or temporary self idea. Uh, and that's the ego. I'm Steve, white dude, physical American guy or whatever. And I, you know, go Steelers and all that kind of stuff. It's physical focus. And if that's what I think I am and that's my desire, my desire, I'm going to get one set of experiences. But as soon as I actually desire to come to know the true self, once that desire gets activated, now we got a whole, it's a game changer. Because now we're going to start to have different experiences. And here's where Sadhguru's question of, um, not, it's not about time. It's about how much do you desire that? If you only desire a wee little bit, you're only going to have wee little bit of spiritual type of experiences, okay? But if you desire it a lot, a wee lot, okay, you're going to have a lot of experiences. In a minute, I'm going to talk about how the science backs this up, okay? So it's if you desire something a little, if I only desire to do the mow, mow my lawn every once in a while, I'm going to have a sort of shabby looking lawn, right? But if I desire it to look good, I'm going to focus on it. I'm going to get better at mowing my lawn. Logical, right? Well, if we want to come to know the true self, and yet we're acting in the physical world like we're going to find it there, we won't. Um, we're, we're not going to ever get to enlightenment. That's going to take a long time. But notice if you shift your desire towards, you know what, I really want this. I really want to come to know who I am. Then all of a sudden the world shifts. And you start to have a different set of experiences, okay? So concept number one, degree number one, desire. How badly do you want to know the true self? How badly do you want spirituality? Subset of that is we're in a world of duality. It's a simple concept to, to remember. What is it that you're seeking? Food for the physical self or food for the spiritual self? Are your relationships physical or are they spiritual? Are you looking at the world physically or are you looking at it spiritually? When you see traffic, do you see a bunch of cars in your way and that's annoying, physical, or do you see spiritual opportunity for patience? It's really simple. When you see other people and the mistakes they make, do you judge them and think they're bad and going to hell or whatever, or do you practice forgiveness and mercy? One is physical focus, one is spiritual focus. You can see where religion gets screwed up because people look at it the wrong way, okay? So concept number one, desire with subset idea of duality. Recognize those concepts. We've got two of the degrees out of the way. All right, second important concept is the idea of a fork. Now, I've said this before. I often say it's a Hindu teaching. But like I said before on the uh, what I call the Buddha idea of that does not further, which is one of my favorite concepts of spiritual development, that Buddha was alleged to have answered 75% of the questions he was asked with the line does not further. Because if you ask a physical oriented question, he would say that does not further, like who should I vote for? Or should I take this job or not? Or you know, what should I eat? And things like that. A whole lot of it was, well, I need more context, okay? I need to understand more about where you're at in your, in your spiritual process. So I, I went researching to look to see, you know, that, that where I came up with it, and I couldn't find it anymore. I'm like, wait, did Buddha say that? I Google it, I'm like, I don't find any evidence of that. And so I'm like, well, ah, the heck with it. I'm saying it then, <laughs> okay? I think the Buddha said it. Truth is truth, though. A lot of things we're trying to do does not further our spiritual development because it doesn't really matter what you do one way or another. Well, here's another one. I always say that the Hindus have this teaching on the, 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 um, the idea of a fork. Is it a fork good or bad? And I just Googled it earlier to try to find that teaching, and I can't find it. So if somebody out there knows where it is, put it in, our, in the comment section of YouTube. But I've, I read it several years ago as a Hindu teaching on the idea of a fork. Is a fork good or bad? And the teaching was very clear. Well, you can use your fork to eat your salad or to stab your waiter in the eye. Okay? Well, in one context, you'd say it's good and useful. In another context, you'd say it's damaging and it's harmful. Okay? And the end of the teaching is everything is a fork. Everything in the world is like a fork. If it's used for good, it's good. If it's used for bad, it's bad. And you could do that with everything. And see, this answers the gun debate, for example, or all our political issues. It depends. That's why the Buddha says does not further. 
It depends on how it's used. Are cars good or bad? If you've had a loved one killed in a car accident, you probably don't like them so much. Are planes good or bad? Well, they're great if you only need to get to California by the weekend, but not if on 9-11, one of your loved ones was killed in, a pl in, in, in one of the towers, right? And so we can do this with everything. Are drugs good or bad? Well, it depends on how it's used. It's always the case. And so everything in the world is a fork. Now, again, that's the simple concept, degree of separation. How we're gonna use that and why, how we're gonna use it towards enlightenment is to recognize, well, science backs this up wonderfully. First of all, in the quantum world, I'm gonna look at two aspects of science, quantum science and some neuroscience, which is to say the physical world is this, in a state of superposition, which is a state of probabilities. And you as an individual observer, remember you're the person who's making the decision, are you spiritual or are you physical? Well, if you look at the world in a certain way, superposition and the observer effect gives you a certain result. And we've talked about this many times before, I use sports all the time. If you're confident while shooting a free throw, you're more likely to make it. If you're distracted by the fans that are booing you, you're less likely, likely to make it. This is true in every one of our ventures. You know, you go on a first date and you're nervous. It's not going to go quite as well. If you're confident, it'll go better, obviously. The way you're looking at a job interview will affect the likelihood of you getting that job. We all know this is true. So the more you have spiritual qualities going on inside of you, the more likely you're going to have a, what you might call a better result, so to speak. Okay. And so this is the quantum world backing up the way we need to be looking at the world as a fork. Good or bad? Is getting a, is not being hired for a job a good thing? Well, it depends. Might it push you into another direction? What, might it make you work on focusing on your interview skills? Could you get a better, better job, right? Could have it been a dead end job or something, you know, whatever. But could it also teach you about the importance of taking disappointment and trusting the universe is trying to guide you towards something? And again, it's not trying to, it just does. It's guiding us ultimately towards number three and number six here, the end game of enlightenment. Because guess what? It doesn't always go our way. Buddha's first truth that we're all going to suffer and the world that we're living in is unsatisfying. Well, we find that all, uh, all the time in our physical experiences. And so here we have quantum um, data, if you will, evidence that we're living in some sort of matrix or illusion. And, and there's a, a whole lot of laws, if you will, that are demonstrating through the way the brain works. If you look at something in a positive way, a healthier way, you produce certain chemicals that make you feel better. If you, if you look at things in a negative way or a resistance type of way, your, your brain produces another set of chemicals. Very simply, we, you know, we produce cortisol or epinephrine, stressful types of drugs and hormones inside our bodies, which create a lot of stress. And the absence of certain chemicals like serotonin, endorphins, and, and dopamine lead to fatigue and depression and other types of experiences, okay? Well, certain perspectives, certain ways of looking at the world produce those very chemicals that make us feel better. Isn't it obvious the universe, if you will, is cultivating an evolution of consciousness? Sure, because no amount of resenting someone makes someone feel better. No amount of trying to cancel someone for having a point of view you disagree with helps. I mean, Buddha would say it does not further because it doesn't get you closer to the goal. I mean, if you're trying to win the world physically, okay, maybe, but as Jesus says, what good is it to gain the world and lose your soul? He's trying to say, look, you can try to desire the flesh, but it's the spirit that we're supposed to be working on. Your choice, though, work on whatever you want. No pressure. Remember, the time it takes is up to you, okay, based upon what you're desiring. And so a concept that I love that fits into the fork is this idea of pronoia. Americans are great at paranoia, worrying about things that could go wrong, things that, that are seemingly bad, and that's because our brains are conditioned to look at the world like that. And who likes the feeling of paranoia? Paranoia literally is the feeling of, that in the brain is a, a lowered state of anandamide, which is your body's natural marijuana. And we feel more fear and more paranoia whenever that chemical goes down. Well, what, what does marijuana give to most people? Little bits of it, balanced doses, if you will, takes the edge off, makes people relax, makes them chill, makes them not worry. But large doses of it, uh, what you might say, addicted or imbalanced doses of it, of it leads to paranoia because it decreases the anandamide in the system, okay? And so you don't need marijuana or heroin or alcohol or any drug. You need the right perspective. 
And looking at the world from a pro and white perspective is this, everything's a fork. If you use whatever's going on in the physical world to the good, you just made it spiritual. If you use it to the bad, you just took it away from the world of spirit. Your decision. And it's not, there's not an inherent truth in any one of these things because everything in the world could be used for good or for bad. Everything. If it's physical, it can be done like that. The Course of Miracles says that to use the flesh to teach spirit. And Jesus in Matthew 5, I think 35, says that the physical world is the footstool and the spiritual world is the throne. And so here we have a, a lower state of flesh. And we're supposed to be using that, well, to rest your feet on it, perhaps like a footstool, or to step on it so you can get higher. And so it's the end-all, be-all isn't the physical world. That's why the Buddha says it's, uh, it's ultimately um, dukkha, which is unsatisfying. Because it's not the end game. But if we insist on it being the end game, well, we're going to have one set of experiences. That's where the science and physics comes in. It's also the concept of maybe the story of the Chinese farmer, right? How many times do we have, go look that one up? Because I'm not going to tell it here. But how many times do we say this is good or this is bad and it turns out to be opposite, right? How many relationships end up very difficult later on? But once you first get into it, you're so happy that it turns out to be complex, okay? Or jobs that you initially love and it turns out to be difficult. Addiction is perfect for this. Early on, it's great. Man, this drug makes me feel good. You know, this alcohol makes me feel good until it doesn't. And everything in the world is like that. But the idea of the fork and the science that backs it up, because it's teaching us pro -noia. No, it's all good. This is why the science, uh, the, it says in Genesis to, to only eat off the tree of life. Because the challenge is seeing it all as good all the time. Whatever it is, whatever your adversity is, negative things are a chance to practice spiritual growth. Positive things are obviously feel good in and of themselves, but we have to practice gratitude, right? And humility. That's what we do when things go well. Those are spiritual things. So the world is a fork. And to get good at the process, again, the three-step process to enlightenment is to first have the desire to be spiritual and then practice the fork concept. Instead of saying, this is good and this is bad, you have to look at it, well, it depends on how it's being used. And everything that comes your way, you assess it like that. Where is the spirit in this? Jesus says that the, if your eye is single, your whole body will be filled with light. Well, that's where that is right there. That if you using it for good, so to speak, which means for your own development, but also for the development of all, you just use the fork correctly, okay? But if you use things as a wedge to hurt other people or to push or suppress other people, well, then you just took the exact same thing that someone else could use for good and you just made it negative, okay? Each individual person has, the, has this option, okay? And it's why Buddha's last words, strive for your own liberation with diligence. You first have to have the desire, then you better approach the world like a fork and be pro annoyed about it, okay? Whatever is happening to you is somehow good. It's also great mental health, okay? Which is why I like to talk about it. All right, so the last phase, we're back to desire. Again, we're trying to make this simple. And the last desire means once you've got this initial desire to come to know who you really are, next thing you know, you got a whole bunch of crazy circumstances start happening to you. It's what Y Guru calls it intense, okay? As soon as you start on an authentic spiritual journey, the universe can tell. Okay, and again, it's the science of this, the observer effect and how electrons seem to know that we're watching and it's watching us and we're, inter we're connected with the world. We're not separate from the world, we're relating to the world. It's Einstein's relativity, okay? The world moves with us. And so the, uh, the desire that we're, that we're ultimately trying to experience over here ends up becoming really difficult because of the crazy stuff that happens when we be become authentically spiritual. Look what Jesus had to go through, okay? High-end stuff. Buddha struggled for years before he finally got it together. Muhammad said, this is terrible. He felt like he was being torn apart. His body was ripped limb from limb. That's what he felt. Because the spiritual process diminishes the ego. That's tough enough. Everyone around you thinks you're crazy. And then you have to give up the, the physical world pursuit and dedicate yourself to a spiritual world pursuit. That's tough work, okay? So you get to that phase and it's like, well, this sometimes doesn't feel like it's worth it. But at that point is where, where I like to compare it to walking on a tightrope. Let's just say either you're interested in walking on a tightrope because it seems like something that would be fun or you need to, okay? Because it's a little bit of both. Nobody's gonna force you out on a tightrope. 
But if over there is a good looking party, and over here, uh, it's not so much fun, and there's like, you know, maybe a, a dinosaur chasing you, and you wanna hurry up and get over there, uh, and there's only a tightrope between you and, and the other side, guess what? You better start walking. Do you wanna take your time with it? Yeah, enough so they don't fall, but you wanna take forever? No, you wanna get there, get there as quickly as possible. So we have to stay focused on that tightrope. And so we must desire the walk across the tightrope. We must desire the desire to be spiritual. But then towards the end, we have to actually desire staying focused, okay? If you only like, oh, I'd love to get to the top of that mountain, but I'm not gonna really put in the effort. Well, then you're not gonna get to the top of the mountain. Again, lawns don't mow themselves. You might desire to mow the lawn and now you're irritated because the lawn's still not mowed, okay? It's in the Buddha's Eightfold Path. Step five is effort. No, step six is effort. Step seven is focus. We get ourselves to a place where we must maintain that desire in a very focused way. And that leads us to the last concept degree of separation. And what is that? Desirelessness. How ironic. I found it, uh, I, I watched the Dalai Lama once. He was asked this question about desire and desiring being spiritual. And he just laughs because he laughs at everything because he gets it. And he said, well, of course you must desire desirelessness. Mm -hmm. Ah, now to most people, their minds just blew. Okay. What does that even mean? How do you desire desirelessness? Well, once you get the process is uh, the one of decreasing, like John says, I must decrease so he may increase. He's referring to the spirit within that we must decrease the ego's desires. Okay, and as it calms down, this other thing called the Tao shows up automatically. Once we remove the ego, it becomes effortless because you don't have to do anything after that. It's simply taming the ego. The Hindu teaching of Siddhi is all about this, is that you have the ability to be perfect because you were born perfect. We just have all these layers on top of us that we have to peel back. And so we have to learn how to cool those jets, you know, calm those desires and get to the point where you're capable of accepting everything. Not that you're going to have to go through everything. You just have to be capable of it. That's also stoicism, okay? The ability to experience a negative event or whatever, whatever it is instead and still be at peace, okay? And we have to work towards that. So we have to desire desirelessness. In there is where I find the three jewels. Buddha taught this wonderfully well. A good way to stay focused on this journey towards desirelessness is to get together with each other in, in Sangha form, which is what we do here. Talk with like-minded people. Politics won't do this very well, but if you only get together with people who are like-minded, Jesus will say, I ain't gonna get you to spiritual, okay? We have to learn how to love enemies. We have to get together and mix it up sometimes. Practice the spiritual virtues with each other. Right, and do so in groups that Sangha. Dharma is to read stuff, watch videos like this, okay? Go read um, the millions of texts that are out there that are talking about this. Learn the rules, Buddha would say, of spirit, okay? The very law that Jesus came to overthrow was the physical desired laws so that he can fulfill the spiritual laws. That's what his story is about. Stop making it so physical. John 6, 63, the flesh counts for nothing. It's the spirit that gives life. The laws we're supposed to be paying attention to are is the very Dharma that Buddha's talking about, okay? And the, the first jewel is Buddha, which is to say, we're already Buddha. You're already there, there's the perfection. It's already inside you. We just got conditioned in this thing called the ego. And we have to learn how to chill that, okay? Calm that down, and then the, the true self shows up, okay? And so here's the process. Again, these are useful concepts, duality, science, and desire, you know, desirelessness. They're all, there's millions of concepts that we could fit into here, but we're trying to make this simple. So we're going to make it three degrees. You first must desire to come to know the true self. And that requires focusing on the spiritual self, which we all have. Not many of us spend much time doing that. And when I've not done it in my life, I get the consequences of that. When I do it, I get some adversities, but I realize there's a point to it. And that leads me to the fork. Well, it depends. Depends on how I look at the fork. Depends on how I look at traffic or my adversities, you know, relationship struggles, death experiences, COVID, good or bad. Depends on how you use it. Okay. Everything's like that. And if you desire to know your spiritual self, you better fork things. Okay. And pay attention to that. Depends on how you use it. 
And that leads us back to staying focused, okay? Once you actually desire to know the true self, you better really desire it. It's another, I think, Hindu teaching that says if you come to a spiritual place in your life and you're desiring to be spiritual, you should approach it like a man whose hair on fire approaches a lake, okay? Notice how this will speed up the process? If you stay focused on your spiritual development, of course you're gonna get through quicker. So don't start a spiritual process and then complain about all the adversity that happens. Attack, okay, go on the attack. So we have to stay focused. We have to desire the completion of this. And that's through actually figuring out desirelessness, okay? And so real simple, make it simple, DFD, desire, fork, and desire.